Praise the Lord. Welcome back to Tough Love on Marriage and Bliss. My name is Kanjago. I am so excited that you are continuing with this conversation. I believe that you're being helped. I believe that you're tracing where you are. As we always say, marriage and bliss is where we are restoring God's order in matters marriage and relationships. And for Tough Love, what we are building is a workforce where we are not retreating neither are we surrendering. So we really thank God for this opportunity. Uh, we'll just do a small recap of where we came from. Uh, we, If you have not watched the previous video, kindly just go back to that previous video where we were dealing with the three troubled marriages, the three kinds of troubled marriages, and we were able to tackle one that can be broken into several. Uh, the first one that we talked about last time was the we are unhappy but willing to work on it kind of marriage uh, that carries the four kinds of uh, we are unhappy but willing to work on it marriage, which are we are okay, we are not okay, we are miserable, and it's about the kids. So today I want us to take us uh, a different toll, a different uh, direction, where we will be handling the next two uh, kinds of troubled marriages, uh, the, the other two that we were not able to handle. The first one we're going to handle is uh, this, my spouse will not change kind of marriage. This is the the second kind of a troubled marriage. The My spouse will not change kind of marriage. Uh, this is where your, your spouse seems contented with where the marriage is, that they are excited, they are happy, they are just there, they don't seem as if there's anything that is wrong in the marriage, they don't look at as if there's anything that uh, that they need changed, even though it is lousy and very uh, little deep satisfaction, there is no satisfaction in the relationship, there is no intimacy in the relationship, but still they feel, um, for me, it is still okay. And I don't know if you're in such a kind of a marriage where you feel your spouse does not feel like there is a problem. You are there, you are always saying, this is a problem, this is where we are, we need to change this, we need to adopt this, and all this is you are trying to do so that you safeguard your marriage. But at the end of the day, your spouse is there and they don't see a big deal. They don't tell you whether there's a problem. They don't tell you whether there's something that needs to be changed. And, and it, it is frustrating. Uh, your spouse wants to stay with you and they don't have a desire for divorce. Divorce is not in the picture. You, you kind of understand that this person, it is not that they want to leave you. It is not that they want you to separate. But what happens is that they don't feel as if there's anything that is a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, at, at this case, you, you want to improve the relationship. You feel burdened by the relationship. You feel there's something you have lost. There's something that is not there in your marriage. There's something that you feel, I wish I had the opportunity to change this matter. I wish I had the opportunity for us to talk about uh, our relationship, for us to talk about our finances, for us to talk about our kids. And you feel, I wish I had this opportunity, but I don't have the power Person that I would want to have this conversation with. Occasionally, uh, your spouse will make a lame, half-hearted attempt to do something differently. They look as if they want to change something. It is, it is a notion that they are creating, that they look as if they want to change something. They look as if uh, they have heartedly have started the direction that you need them to go. They look as if something is, is, is working at least once. And, and sometimes we get excited because this is the only time that this person has actually shown interest in the marriage. Most of the times you feel like your spouse does not show interest. Maybe he comes in the evening and it is a routine. Uh, he will come, take a shower, then sit down, take a, uh, take a meal, then go to sleep. And, and you feel we are in a routine that I am only waking up to prepare you. I'm only, uh, you're only going to work so that you can provide. And you feel it is it is tiresome. You're getting drained. And, and it seems as if they don't want to do anything concerning that. But at the end of the day, when they decide to do something about it, it is half-lived. 
that you, you will feel there is a place that they have gotten to and instead of it becoming something that you will look forward to seeing uh, the other time, it, it gets to be something that you don't even want to feel. It is something that you don't even want to see because the frustration becomes more and more the moment they try to do something but there is nothing that is happening. You know what you are missing. Personally, you know what you are missing and you're willing to do whatever it takes to enrich your marriage. You know, you are sure that what is missing in our marriage is communication. What is missing in our marriage is the times that we used to have. We used to have date nights. We used to have talks. We, we used to go out. We used to uh, take care of each other. We used to call one another. But now it is not there. You know what you're missing. You know what is not there in the relationship. But the problem is that the other party is not willing to help you out. You are willing to do everything to enrich your marriage, but you feel as if you are the only one carrying the burden. You are the one carrying the, the things on your shoulder. You have seen it. You are talking about it. You are always there telling that other person, you know, we need to work on this, but they are not willing. You ask them to go for a marriage seminar. Oh my goodness. It becomes something that is so major that they don't want to talk about it. You ask them to go and get together with couples, other couples, that are in your lineage, other couples that are in your church, other couples that are in your family, people that you know, you can easily share a lot with and you invite them. You want to walk with them, but your spouse does not want to, to, to be there. They don't want other people to be involved in your marriage and they feel as if they are intruding. But in the real sense, you know what you're lacking and you know where you can get it. You know other people who are thriving in what you are lacking. Uh, also, you encourage them to read a book. Like, uh, personally, I've done a book called Enrich, and that book has questions, has uh, a lot of information, researched information, revelation from the Holy Spirit. And you ask your, your, your spouse, let us read this book and see if it will help us. But they are not willing. You see, you have put up the energy, you have put up uh, a lot of strength, you have put up a lot of effort for you to see something happening. But this other person is not willing to, to do the same. Always he says no. Always they have an excuse. You have asked them to go and see a pastor so that they can help you, but always they don't want to help. That is the kind of marriage where your spouse is not willing to change. He is not willing or she is not willing to change. Even though sometimes they might try, they may look at as if they are trying and, and they try some of the options that you give, but there is no effort that is put in it. He makes zero changes. She makes zero changes. You talk about, we will start having conversations. We will, st we will start sitting together and having at least one hour of conversation every day. But you will see no effort from their end. You will see no change from their end. Sometimes they even come and say, you know, I'm sorry. I have realized where I'm going wrong. I've realized where it, the problem is. And they look as if they are remorseful. But at the end of the day, nothing changes. You are sick and tired of hearing the no. You are sick sick and tired of every attempt that you are giving. You are sick and tired of every uh, resource and every uh, commendation that you're giving, that you're looking forward for it to help, but at the end of the day, nothing is happening. You're sick and tired of it because there is no progress in the relationship. Two years, three years down the line, nothing is changing and you get frustrated. At the end of the day, you're also human. As much as, yes, you want to put effort in this relationship, as much as, yes, you want to put effort in everything that you want to do and see in this relationship, uh, it, it becomes tiresome. You have carried the load for very long. The biggest question at this particular time, the biggest question that you have in your heart and in your mind, and I believe that by the time we are continuing with this uh, with this videos, as, as you continue listening, as we continue with this course uh, and, and with this um, outline, as we continue, you will get answers. The biggest question for the most, my spouse will not change kind of marriage, is how can I motivate my spouse to want to work on our marriage? I have, I have sat with being a, a marriage therapist and a marriage a mentor. I have sat with people in their different stages of marriages. I have sat with people who are in 
their in their toddler stage. I have start, sat with people who are in their infant stage. I have sat with people who are in their teenage stage of their marriage. That their marriage is uh, between 13 and uh, 19 years of, of age. And, and you realize they are in the teenage phase. I've sat with people and the one question that is always uh, taken back to me, how can I motivate him? How can I motivate her to at least want to work on our marriage? What should I do so that they feel as if they are, they are willing to also do and put effort in this marriage? The third kind of marriage, the third kind of troubled marriage that we would want to talk about, which is the last one for now, is the my spouse has sinned big time kind of marriage. You feel your spouse has committed a serious major sin and you it has a big impact that they have done something that is so major that you don't feel as if you're willing to forgive them. There is something that is so major that they have done and you don't uh, you don't want to, to be associated with them, that you have just discovered the sin or you have finally had enough courage to stand against the sin that you have been seeing in them, the pattern that you have been seeing them take, that they, they, they have done ugly things, they have done nasty things, they have spoken things, and, and uh, the, one, the only word uh, that you can use to describe them or their behavior, the only word is sin, something that breaks your heart, something that shatters your heart in different pieces, and you're always frustrated. Anytime you talk about what they have done, maybe they were involved in infidelity, maybe they were involved in money laundering, maybe they were involved in robbery, maybe they were involved in some sins uh, that maybe you don't even, uh, you, you, you don't want to even think about. When, when you use the word sin, you talk about a major, huge, and massive offense that tears apart the very core of your marriage. When you use sin, it is a major thing. It is a, a massive thing. It is a huge thing that is tearing apart the very fabric of your relationship and of your marriage. That this kind, some of the kinds of sins that maybe would lead to uh, you being in that kind of a marriage where you, you say, my spouse has really sinned big time. That this kind of marriage, it is my spouse's responsibility that they have not done what they needed to do. Number one, they may have committed adultery. Maybe you caught them, maybe they, they, they confessed, maybe they were caught in the act, maybe something happened and you got to know that they were actually in adultery. Number two is when your spouse is involved in pornography and, and you have been there trying to, to spice up your marriage, trying to work on your marriage, but you realize that at the end of the day, this guy, this lady is into pornography and this is a major sin that you feel you will not want to be associated with them because you understand the effects and the kind of things and the kind of doors that are opened by being involved in pornography. Number three is when a person is involved in alcohol and drugs that you have realized that this guy when we got married, this girl when we got married, I didn't know that they were involved in, in some of these things or maybe I even knew but now it is irritating me that they, have, they are in alcohol, they are in drugs, they are using all the kinds of drugs that you feel now we are losing touch. There is something that is being ripped out of me. There is something that is that is being taken out of me and, and it's, it's something that is very difficult difficult to even absorb. Number four is that they have a very bad temper. This is a sin that you feel uh, because of their temper, they can do anything. They can say anything. They can act in any kind of way. And, and it, is a, it is something that is now getting to your nerves. And you feel, I, there's nothing I am doing in this relationship because now this person is not willing to work with me to to change what is happening. And their nasty temper is causing them to be verbally abusive, physically abusive, emotionally abusive, that they, they are now getting to that place where they are irritating you. They, the abuse has become too much that you're getting tired of the person that you are married to. Physical abuse 
physical abuse. They have hit you. We always say, if a person ever hits you once, and this is not uh, this is not about men and women. It is for both of you. If a lady ever threatens to hit you, be sure that one day it will happen. If a man ever threatens to hit you, one day it will happen. And this is a place where you tell yourself, by the way, I'm not here so that I can die. I know our slogan is no retreat, no surrender, but anytime there is uh, there is something that is causing the very fabric of the marriage to tear down, that then you are not you are not coerced, you are not pushed to stay in the marriage. It is always very important to first look at your safety. I, I have been involved in uh, training for um, for first aid, and the first thing that you are taught is that you should. Take care of your safety. As much as you want to help someone else, as much as you want to take care of someone else, the first and most important responsibility is for you to take care of your safety. So anyone that is physically abusive, it is something that is a red flag that you need to look at. And you, look, you need to look at. Number six is that this person is a workaholic. This is a big thing that they are always at work. They get, they come from home, work, they come home, they are always on their laptops. They are always on their screens. They are trying to work something. They are trying to crunch something. And at the end of the day, it is tearing the very fabric of your marriage. That the communication is no longer there because this guy, this lady is always working. That they have put more effort. That anytime you are doing something together and the boss calls them, it is you that will have to sacrifice. Anytime that you are doing something that is supposed to grow the marriage and the boss or someone at work calls them, it is you that will sacrifice the time because they have to rush and work on something that they have been called upon to do. Whether they are on leave or not, sometimes they, they, they behave in that way. Number seven is a gambling addiction. There are people that have realized that my spouse is actually in gambling and all our money, instead of helping us, instead of being uh, money that will help our children, instead of it being money that you have put together so that it helps us, it becomes money that he uses or she uses for gambling. The gambling addiction does not easily end. It is like any other addiction. It formats your mind. It causes your mind to uh, act in a particular way. It causes your mind to move in a particular direction and which is very, very wrong. And, and gambling causes you to lose a lot of money as much as, yes, sometimes we want to show the way there are people who have won the jackpot. There are people who are have won a lot of money, but at the end of the day, if you follow their lives, you realize this person was not going any, anywhere. Number eight is a reckless and irresponsible financial mistakes. That this person is involved in reckless financial use. That this person does not think about the future. There is nothing that they are putting. And, and you can easily tell this person is not part of this marriage. They are actually doing their own things out there. That anytime they get 10,000, the first thing that they want to do is to, to, to do something that does not benefit the family, something that does not benefit the, the home and all that. Number nine is that this person is controlling that you cannot make decisions, you cannot uh, do what you want, you cannot become who you want, that they are overly controlling. And it becomes a big problem when you start living with a person who is trying to control every area of your life. If you start living with a person who wants to control your life in every corner, then there is a problem. Whether it is a man or it is a lady, sometimes we have realized that there are men who have uh, who have tendencies. We think that they are okay. We think that everything is going well in their lives. We think that everything that they have prayed for has come to pass. But at the end of the day, if you scrutinize well, if you follow through well, you will realize that they are actually being controlled by their wives. Number 10, which is also very important, number 10 characteristics is that they are lazy. This spouse is lazy. Either they don't want to work because you're working. They don't want to find money. They don't want to put resources. And it gets worse when it is the man who has this tendency. It gets very worse when it is the man who wants to become lazy, who wants to become the slow one, who wants to become uh, nothing 
amount to nothing in this relationship. That we have to push ourselves to become better. Someone tell, told me that if you are not willing to invest the time that God has given you now, then you will have nothing to reap. The Bible says, early in the morning will I, uh, will I devour my prey and late in the evening will I distribute it. That whatever you, you, you devour early in the morning, early in the morning is not just in the morning, it is in the early stages of your lives, the early stages of the marriage, the early stages of the relationship. If you devour nothing during this phase, then you will have nothing to distribute at the older age. The older age is when you are, you are you're supposed to be living an inheritance. Uh, we were given someday a, a breakdown of what life needs to be. 20 to 30, you need to start building something. And whatever you build, you, you have the time to make all the mistakes that you need to make. If you're married between 20 and 30 years uh, of your life, then that 20 to 30 years, you, you need to start anything and everything that you can make all the mistakes because you still have time. Between 30 and 40, you still need to have something that you're building upon. If there is nothing, there's no particular line that you have taken, there is nothing that you are doing in a particular direction, then between 30 and 40, you will have nothing to build when you get to 40 to 50. Because 40 to 50 is when now you establish systems that are not about you. This is a place where you put up a business and it works independent away from you. You put up a business and there's someone else that can run it. You don't have to be there. Between 50 and 60, that is when people start retiring, even in the business. This is a place where you can step behind and watch your daughters, watch your sons as they build a life of their own. And that, this is something that is very important. For some of our marriages, we are in the 20 to 30 years. We are 30 years and above. We are 30 years to 40 years. And sometimes we realize when it is too late that we need to start building. And you see, this building is not just for business. It is also for family. That when you want, between 20 and 30 years, you can make all the mistakes as a couple. Between 20 and 30 years, you, you, can, you can make all the, the bad decisions as a couple. But when you get to 30 to 40 years, then you, are, you need to start, you need to understand your niche. You need to understand what, we are, what are we doing as a married couple in this generation and what is expected of us. So it is always very important that whatever you devour in the morning is what you will distribute in the evening. So make sure that even in your marriage, you are devouring something in your early ages of life so that when you get to the older ages of life, you are able to push forward. Again, this is not a bad news only. I know we have talked about the three uh, different kinds of troubled marriages, but all hope is not lost. There is something that we can do, and that is why we are here. We are not here to, to just show you how bad your marriage is. We are not here to just show you uh, how bad other people's marriages are. We are here to also show and share with you that there is more good news. There is always good news. Uh, if your marriage is in any of these three categories, if you're asking yourself the question that uh, what can I do about it? What can I change about it? That is why we are here. We did not come up with this phrase uh, that, that we are saving marriages for no reason. It was not a cliche. It is not something that we, we sat down and said, you know, it looks catchy. When we say tough love, it doesn't, it, it is not about it looking very nice, looking catchy, looking very interesting. It is about solving and causing a change in the marriage. Actually, let me tell you the truth. By the time you are continuing with this manual, you will realize that a lot in your marriage and a lot in your life will be changing. One, you don't, you don't want uh, a divorce. You're not there for a divorce. You're not there for separation. You are there to work on your marriage. You're willing to put effort in your marriage. Whether the other person is willing or not, you're willing to put effort in that marriage. So the reason why we are doing this, the reason why we are moving with this is so that we become effective in whatever we do. Allow me just to pray for you. Even before I, I, I invite you to subscribe and all that, allow me just to pray for you. You might be in the, any category of the three that we have mentioned. Maybe you are in the 
where we are we are we we are not okay but we are willing to work on it maybe you are in that phase where my spouse has sinned big time maybe you are in that phase where my spouse does not want to change and and you're asking yourself what can i do about it let me just pray for you so that at the end of the day even as we continue we are just about to start now the work itself what we are doing now is we are exposing what is happening in our marriages so that when we start working you understand where you are coming from we always say we work from the known to the unknown so now we know where we are we need to shed light on where we are going allow me to pray for you father in the name of jesus we thank you and we glorify your name thank you for your sons and your daughters thank you for the things that you have revealed upon them in their lives oh god thank you because they have realized in any kind of the troubled marriages that they may be in in the different phases of life, I declare, Father, may you cause them to enter the space where they will enjoy marriage, where they will enjoy their lives, oh God, that they will not become a burden to the other person. They will not become a burden to themselves. I pray that, Father, may you cause them to understand better. As we continue with this, may you give us grace, may you give us your presence, and may you give us your power. And it is in Jesus' name that we do pray and even believe. So now I will welcome you to, in, uh, to invite as many people as possible if this information is helping you, don't keep it to yourself. Just make sure you share it with a lot of people. Share the video, share the link. Uh, make sure you subscribe and you hit the, uh, the notification button so that whenever we are putting uh, and uploading our content, that you will always be among the first people that will come and listen to the content because I believe this is revelation that has come from God. This is not uh, just a logos. It is now a rhema, word that is living within us so that we can alter the way things are happening happening in our marriages. So don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to, to like. Don't forget to share. Don't forget to call as many people as possible. Also interact with us on the, on the chat box. Let us talk. Let us talk to one another. Let us have, find solutions. If you have any question, just share it there and we will be sure to respond to you. So thank you very much for being a part of this. Thank you very much for always consistently being a part of it. Let us continue learning together so that we can restore God order in matters marriage and relationships. This is Tough Love. My name is Kanjagwa. Remember no retreat, no surrender. There is nowhere we are going. We will work on our marriages until they work. God bless you. See you next week, same time, same place and it is going to be a blessing. It is a goodbye from us today. God bless you.